and thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's lovely to be able to connect with you. As you can see, I'm in a really beautiful place. I'm actually on a Greek island and I've been here for lockdown. Um, and I, I feel very lucky to have been here, but I have to say that I was so looking forward to coming to Salisbury, to performing for you, to meet you all. Um, and there were so many fantastic projects planned, but I'm really pleased um, and thank you to Salisbury for inviting me to do this so I can actually connect with you at least through the magic of technology and through the internet. So um, I'm really happy to invite you on this journey with me talking about some of the pieces that I really love, that I love to perform, and the artists that have inspired me, that I love working with, um, and it's been great to collaborate with. And maybe it'll inspire you to look up some of those pieces and find out a bit more about them. Um, so the first piece I'm going to talk about is one that I'm sure most of you know. It's Vivaldi's Four Seasons. It's a joy for me to perform. And I grew up listening to it and I absolutely adored it. But I've learned so much more about it since performing it and learning it. Um, Vivaldi is such an incredibly imaginative composer. Just brilliant. And his creativity just shines in this piece. Although it was written in 1726, I believe it is the first example that I know of of a tone poem where he is literally describing what is happening in a scene um, musically. Um, so in winter, he describes the chattering teeth and stamping on the snow and snowflakes falling and warm crackling fires. But I thought for today, obviously it's a bit more appropriate to be talking about summer. I think most of us associate summer with beautiful balmy evenings and hot days and relaxation and less work. But Vivaldi summer doesn't seem to have that element of release. It's quite a stressed summer. And what astounded me when I started learning this piece is I hadn't realised when I was listening all those years ago as a little one to this piece that he actually wrote sonnets that accompany each season. So I'm going to read the sonnet that accompanies Summer. Beneath the harsh season inflamed by the sun, man languishes, the flock languishes, and the pine tree burns. The cuckoo unleashes its voice, and as soon as it's heard, the turtle dove sings, and the goldfinch too. Sweet Zephyrus blows, but Boreas suddenly opens a dispute with his neighbour. And the shepherd weeps, for he fears a fierce storm looming and his destiny. The fear of lightning and fierce thunder and the furious swarm of flies and blowflies deprives his weary limbs of repose. Oh, alas, his fears are only too true. The sky thunders, flares, and with hailstones, severs the heads of the proud grain crops. So that's Vivaldi's summer. So I thought I might start by playing the cuckoo. I think most of us associate the cuckoo with delight and and with summer and it's very gentle and and round but Vivaldi's cuckoo is, is not quite like that for a start it's on a minor third rather than the softer more open major third which we might have imagined it with or, or heard it with um, and I love that Vivaldi does that and then he adds these semiquavers which makes it sound even more from an aesthetic.
So the end of Vivaldi summer finishes with a storm. But in my mind, that beginning bit about the pine tree burning really sticks with me. I've, I've been here on this very island, which I love, and seen the wildfires coming closer and seeing the flames lick the land of our neighbors and had to watch through the night to see it getting closer and closer before we had to flee. And it was terrifying. And like an actor who draws on those experiences, I think one does that as a performer as well. So I often think about that when I'm playing this piece. And so here's a part where it ends with the storm, but in my mind, it's the wildfire. <laughs> So from one fabulous piece of music about nature to another, I do perform another Four Seasons, but this one is quite different. This is actually by the Argentinian composer Astor Piazzolla, and it's called The Four Seasons of Buenos Aires. Astor Piazzolla is, was, he died in 1992, a fantastic composer. Um, he brings together all sorts of influences. So he studied classically, um, but then found his real voice was in his native uh, tango. Uh, he played bandonian in a tango band and he was encouraged by his teacher, Nadia Boulanger, to, to bring the tango into his composition. And he, he totally revolutionized the genre. Uh, this piece is so wonderful to play and the arrangement is so clever. He would have played this in his, and he did, and recorded it in his tango band. But this arrangement for violin and strings um, juxtaposes uh, Piazzolla's tango with bits of the uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And because uh, Buenos Aires is, is southern hemisphere, in summer you have quotes from Vivaldi's winter. So it's very brilliant writing, and this is a quote from Spring. Piazzolla segues neatly into this next piece, uh, which is with my group Cosmos. Um, I adore playing music from all around the world. Um, I started playing classically, and, and obviously I still do. Um, but I also love different styles with their different characters and their different techniques. And I get to explore this with my group Cosmos and with Meg, wonderful viola player, and Milos, incredible accordion player. And we get to be really creative. We write our own music, we improvise, we try and learn the styles really seriously and then have a lot of fun with them. This is actually another piece of Piazzolla and this was one that I had the chance to arrange um, for symphony orchestra. because so we did it as an encore after a concerto that was written for us. Um, and it's the first time I had the chance to write something for such a big palette. So our parts were arranged by the three of us and then I orchestrated it. So 
This is Piazzolla's Liber Tango, meaning uh, free tango. So we, I took that and we took that very literally. So there are lots of sections of freedom. In fact, at the beginning, the conductor doesn't know when we're going to come in. We have to just gesture to him and, and hope that he, he understands. And, and he does brilliantly. And then at the end as well, um, it, there was no actual written ending. We just, we just, the three of us, uh, Meg, Milos and I were, were improvising. And it was when I showed the conductor, uh, you know, I think I gave him a four bars or something uh, signal that the, the orchestra would end. And luckily we all ended together. Anyway, it was so much fun. And I think it was also fun for the orchestra who wasn't used to playing um, without having exact uh, things, um, endings, for example, or without knowing exactly when they were coming in. Uh, what was written for them was exact because I gave them all parts. But then there were some things looped like a jazz musician might do, which was I think that was really nice. Anyway, we had a ball. And so this is our version of Astor Piazzolla's Liber Tango.
as I said, I feel so very lucky to work with Meg and Milos, and I also get to work with some other amazing musicians and collaborators. And one project which has just been so incredibly fruitful and given me such soul food over the last few years is a project, a collaboration with the artist Maggie Hambling and with the composer Deborah Pritchard. It was actually quite a hard decision for me to decide whether to go into music or whether to go into art. And I loved both probably equally. Um, but I knew that if I wanted to play violin seriously, that like a ballet dancer, you have to put in the hours when you're very young. Um, so I made that decision at 16 that I would really focus on violin, thinking that I would then be able to do both and come back to my art. Um, and I've sent through some, some pictures of some, some of the things I did when I was a teenager, so hopefully you can see them. But sadly, I really haven't had the chance to go back to it because violin is just such a hungry beast not just the violin itself, but also all that it takes to be able to have a career as a musician. There's just so much that goes into it. But I am hoping to go back to my art and actually in lockdown, I have had a bit of a chance and maybe at some point I'll share some of that. Um, but this project was so fantastic because I got to experience that. Um, Deborah and I came up with this idea that it would be wonderful to work with an artist and Deborah is a synesthetic composer so she sees colours when she hears certain intervals so this is really wonderful to work with and we discussed artists that we were inspired by and I love the work of Maggie Hambling and so we contacted her and Maggie loved the idea of doing something together so we went to meet her in Suffolk and I will never forget it literally arriving at the station and being picked up by Maggie in her car called Marilyn and going to her incredible studio in the middle of fields and walking into her studio and the smell of the oil paints was just so intoxicating to me seeing her art all around and to be honest I was very much in awe of Maggie and then she revealed this set of paintings she'd been working on called Wall of Water and they were these astonishing canvases, absolutely enormous and so powerful and Deborah and I were just dumbstruck. And we set to work in the studio and Deborah would come up with motifs and I would try them and we played things to Maggie and this project has, has grown so that was the Wall of Water Concerto, based on these 13 paintings. So I'd like to play you an extract from that. And it's great because Salisbury's involved with this, fest with this project too. Um, we performed Edge, the next concerto in the series at the festival last year, inspired by Maggie's uh, paintings about global warming. And then we have a new premiere of a Pritchard Hambling Mackenzie collaboration, especially for Salisbury Festival too. But here is our Wall of Water um, concerto by Deborah Pritchard, inspired by the paintings of Maggie Hambling.
I wanted to share with you a more intimate piece of music and I couldn't not include some Bach in my videos. I was trying to think about what to say about Bach and the conclusion I came to is that there are no words. He's also a composer that, for me, it wasn't an instant love affair like Mozart was, for example, but it's something that has grown and grown and continues to grow. And this summer I would have been doing a fantastic project with dancers um, to Bach solo violin partita. And it's, it's music that will be on, on life's journey with me, I think, um, always. Not just the solo violin music, but also his, his piano music, his keyboard music, the passions. Um, there's just so much and it's so deep. This particular piece was actually originally a keyboard invention and it was considered just like a, a technical exercise. He wrote them for his students and it was to develop two things, to develop a cantable style of playing and to develop um, independence in both hands. But I think these pieces are so much more than mere studies. They're little gems in themselves and I arranged them for two violins and here I am playing invention number two with violinist Philip Lamone. Finally, I'd just like to say thank you so much for, for listening and coming on this journey with me. And um, I hope you've enjoyed some of the pieces and, and maybe um, you might be interested to, to listen to some more of them or to look them up and, and uh, listen to them in, in full. Um, and I want to say thank you to the Salisbury team who have been just so wonderful um, throughout the year, really, and in planning the festival and... It's been great to work with them and I hope that 2021 everyone will be um, back at the festival together and will be in person and able to perform for you live.